All right, welcome back. This is part two of our session eight, criminal psychology uh, lesson. So here we have the Cantor approach, also known as the five-factor model. And this was invented by the British psychologist, David Cantor, and he wrote quite a few books about uh, criminal psychology, but he boils down five factor models into these five factors. First one is interpersonal coherence. Second is significance of time and place. Third, criminal characteristics. Fourth is criminal career. And fifth is forensic awareness. All right, so the first one, interpersonal co coherence. The word interpersonal means between two persons, a relationship between two people. How do they interact with people? And then coherence, how does it tie together? Offenders' criminal activities relate to features of his non-criminal activities. So what that means is that um, why he kills or how he chooses um, how to kill and how does he choose his victims may be tied to personal elements in his life or her life. So, for example, a rapist may target women who look like an ex-girlfriend. So, as mentioned earlier, Ted Bundy had a girlfriend that had brown hair, uh, fair skin with a part in the middle. So, this happens to be a picture of Ted Bundy with the girlfriend that ended up dumping him. And then right here, uh, we have pictures of four women that were victims of Ted Bundy. So, this was uh, a coincidence, apparently, but maybe it suggested a motive to his killings. So we want to look at factors like that, or something like Pogo the Clown. So we're going to talk a little more about him um, coming up. Um, he was the neighborhood clown. He went to parties. The, uh, the neighbors knew him. So little, and he ended up targeting little boys that probably were at the parties that he was the clown at. So people trusted him. Number two is the significance and of time and place. The choice of time in which a crime was committed might indicate the criminal's work hours, and the time between crimes may indicate a motive. So if they pause between the killings, it might suggest that they're trying to um, shake off uh, law enforcement to try to let their uh, trail cool down a little bit before acting again. Um, Next up, this choice of place may be one of special significance to the criminal. So, for example, Ed Gein, um, he lived with his mom at, his, uh, at their home on the farm, and that he was a mama's boy, and then he was very, very unwell. We might even say antisocial. So, um, he never um, had girlfriends or really friends, and um, his mother was his only influence. So, whenever he ended up passing, he ended up digging up his mother out of her grave and then skinning her, uh, and then taking the body home. And eventually he skinned his mother and wore his mother's skin. And then eventually it evolved to digging out other women's bodies and also skinning them at home, as well as um, I think he ended up having live victims as well. So where he did it happened to be all around home. So it obviously made it uh, it made it obvious to investigators that, that all these crimes might have something to do with his relationship with the, his mother. And then the movie Psycho is actually based on this. And then, uh, or if uh, the crime scene is randomly spread out from a central home, it might suggest that this person doesn't want the cops on his tracks, wants to get away. So they are gonna sprinkle around the crime so it's harder to follow him. And number three are your criminal characteristics. We want to uh, come up with a list of seemingly significant characteristics and how they compare to the evidence. An example of this is your organized versus disorganized method of example. So once again, we're trying to figure out motives based on their characteristics. So this is actually a figure from one of David Cantor's uh, published papers. And then the shapes uh, of the square shows organized Behaviors as a triangle show disorganized. And then the circles actually indicate at a frequency of which these occur within these criminal profiles. So in the, cir in the circle in the middle indicates behaviors that happen 50% of the time. The, uh, the second inner circle would be between 20 to 40%. Uh, this second to last circle is 10 to 20%. And any behaviors in the very outside of the circle indicate behaviors that happen less than 10% of the time. So right in the middle, uh, where 50% is victims alive uh, for sex as well as rape. 
as well as overkill in concealment and disposed of bodies. So these are very common behaviors and it shows a, a sexual intent and so on, uh, but nothing too extraordinary. But as you move outwards, um, it can show different types of behaviors. So for example, if you look at the very outside where the behaviors happen less than 10%, we have parts of the body missing. They mutilate the thoracic cavity or like the chest area. They dismember the body, they disembowel the body, maybe decapitate, mutilate genitals, mutilate abdomen. Uh, violence against the genitals or burning their victims. These are very, uh, apparently rare behaviors and they're very violent and it might suggest someone who, um, is a throw killer who enjoys the process of killing someone who derives pleasure from process or maybe it just shows that they're very angry at this person and so on. Number four is their criminal career. We want to figure out, uh, is this person a one-time a criminal or is this a career or serial offender? So serial offenders typically behave in a similar fashion throughout their careers. So for example, when we're talking about someone like Ted Bundy, he targeted women with light skin, brown hair and the part in the middle. And he pretended that he needed help by parking his VW bug on the side of the road and asking help from college girls. And then um, this was his shtick. And then also something to also note is that their behaviors may adapt or change in subsequent offenses based on past experiences. So if you almost got caught because your victim screamed too much, you might muffle them later. Or if you almost got caught because your victim um, almost ran away, you might handcuff them and so on. So these are some of the behaviors that a criminal psychologist is looking out for. And the last but not least for the Cantor model is forensic awareness. Is the criminal aware of police techniques and do they try to avoid them? This could be evidence of a career criminal. So going back to Ted Bundy here, we have some items that were found in his trunk. So we have um, a crowbar here, rope. We have more um, more rope as well, looks like a shoelace. We have a flashlight, handcuffs, an ice pick, gloves, as well as a ski mask. Uh, so this is a pantyhose with a mask, uh, mouth and eyes cut open, trash bags, and a duffel bag. And it looks like it could be either a tarp or uh, strips of cloth. So just thinking about this, how does this suggest? Um, are they aware of the police or not? So this shows that Ted Bundy was prepared that he had criminal intent and he is aware of forensic techniques. So for examples, if you don't want to leave uh, fingerprints around, you're going to get gloves. If you don't want your victims to escape, you're going to use cuffs or rope. If you don't want to be seen, you're going to wear a ski mask and so on. And if you want to get rid of your evidence, you might need some trash bags or a tarp to cover up uh, your vehicle. So the, so the, the victims don't leave evidence. So all of this points towards someone who is aware that of how he might be caught and he's trying to evade authorities. Uh, so the next model we have is the Turvey approach, also known as the four-factor model. This was developed by Brent E. Turvey, a California-based private criminal profiler. So the four factors that he has is number one, equivocal forensic analysis. Number two, victimology. Number three, crime scene characteristics. Number four, offender characteristics. So um, Tarvey's approach is a little different than um, than Cantor's approach. Cantor tend to focus on the perpetrator, whereas Turvey tends to have a more holistic pictures that looks at not only the offender, but also the victims in the crime scene. So first, what equivocal forensic analysis is to the understanding that any piece of evidence may be subject to more than one interpretation. All possible interpretations must be considered and the most likely one chosen. Number two is the victimology. Uh, victims are profiled just like the criminal would be. Knowing how, what, when, where, and why victims are selected allows law enforcement to infer information to find perpetrators. Number three, crime scene characteristics, distinguishing fe features of a crime scene as evidenced by the choice of victim, location, and the meaning to the criminal. 
And then number four, offender characteristics. After analyzing the first three steps, the investigator creates a picture of the offender. Possible features include physical characteristics, their gender, the presence of type of vehicle, residence and workplace, criminal history, their aggressiveness, as well as their level of skill. So essentially, it gets to the same thing. We want to create a criminal profile of the offender, and then we're making inferences based on how they conducted the crime. Who did they choose? Why? And um, things such as, we go back to number one, um, what was the purpose, the motives behind the killing? And that's going to help us paint a picture of the offender so we can eventually catch them. All right. So next up, we have typology. So this is specifically refers to serial killers. And we can criminally profile them based on the following motives. So we uh, can type them based on the following four motives. Number one, are visionary killers. Number two, mission-oriented killers. Three, hedonistic killers, which can be broken down to three other characters subcategories and four power and control killers all right so we're going to start off with our visionary killers these are the serial killers they tend to commit crimes at the command or uh, of hallucinated voices or visions so these are the types of people who said that god or satan a demon an angel some somebody has told them to kill and almost always they suffer from mental illness so the example we have here is a guy named David Berkowitz, also known as Son of Sam. So he was active as a serial killer in New York City during the summer of 1976. And then uh, he shot people that were sitting in their cars. And then his claim was that his neighbor's dog was possessed by Satan and he told him to kill. I'm gonna go ahead and read this little short little letter, but he wrote quite a few letters to the media. So, so this one, I say goodbye and good night. Please let me haunt you with these words. I'll be back. I'll be back to be interpreted as bang, 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 bang. Uh, yours in murder, Mr. Monster. Uh, the next one we have are your mission-oriented serial killers. They seek to eliminate certain types of people to change society. So some are racially or religiously motivated attacks. So not a serial killer exactly, but if you're talking about uh, terrorist groups such as ISIS, Islamic State, they would fall under mission-oriented. Example here, if you cannot recognize him, this guy's name is Ted Kaczynski. It's also known as the Unabomber. I spelled that wrong. It's U-N-A-B-O-M-B-E-R. So he was a former Harvard professor. He was like a boy genius. He was the, one of the youngest professors uh, at Harvard ever. And um, he was known for sending bombs to universities as well as airlines. So he's called the Unabombers because uh, uni uh, UN for university, A for airline, bomber. And he claimed that technology is a threat to civilization and would become a disaster for the human race. So they were developing a lot of technology, such as the computer and the internet at the time. And he thought that this would um, be a, a disaster for the human race, which I kind of agree with, but not to his level. Uh, so he sent bombs to professors as well as researchers and so on. And he, he was out and about for quite some time, for a very long time. He lived in a little cabin by himself and he was very intelligent, was able to get away with things. And here's a picture of a, of a remodel. So this is not an actual one, but this is um, a letter bomb that was recreated to show what he would do. And he would also send package bombs and so on. Um, also, interesting fact for you guys to look up, uh, before this all happened, he was considered normal, but he was a test subject in the CIA LSD mind control experiment called MK Ultra. So you might want to look into that a little bit. Uh, number three are hedonistic killers. So the word hedonism uh, refers to the pursuit of pleasure, sensual self-indulgence. So hedonistic killers kill for fun, the kill for pleasure, and they can be broken down into three categories. The first one are comfort killers, second are lust killers, and third, last but not least, are your thrill killers. So the first type of hedonistic killer are your comfort killers. 
they tend to kill for profit or material wealth. They want your money or your stuff. And these victims tend to be uh, close to the perpetrator. And this is uh, the category most women fall under. And they tend to use drugs or poison, so you wouldn't suspect them. They want to be pretty discreet. And they tend to get away with it for quite some time. And they will wait between victims to avoid suspicion. So um, <laughs> referring to pop culture now, Carol Baskins might be a comfort killer. All right, so the example I have here is Dorothea Puente, I guess. She ran a boarding home in Sacramento, so there's a picture of her boarding home, and she cashed the social security checks of old and disabled tenants, and they killed them if uh, they complained. So she uh, would bury her victims with that shovel. Second type of hedonistic killers are your lust killers. They gain sexual pleasure from mutilating or having sex with corpses, drinking their blood, or cannibalizing. So they specifically kill because it turns them on. So the example I have here is Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, before he was caught, he killed uh, 17 boys and men. Um, so apparently the story goes that the reason why he started killing them was because um, he uh, was very attached to men and then he didn't want them to leave him. So his first victim was like a boyfriend or a guy that he hooked up with. He didn't want him to leave, so he killed him. And since that got started, he kept on killing and killing and he was known for raping and dismembering uh, the victims' bodies, so B-O-D-I-E-S, with an emphasis on keeping their severed remains. So he, since he, he didn't want them to leave, he would uh, keep their skulls, he would keep body parts in his uh, refrigerator, and then he actually even ate a little bit of one of his victims so that they were inside him. Um, some of his victims were uh, dissolved in acid. So that is actually the barrel. F and this is a picture of uh, his apartment where he would dissolve the bodies in acid. Uh, third type of hedonistic killer are your throw killers. So they derive pleasure not from the sexual aspect, and they might not even have uh, sex with their victims, but from the pleasure and terror, uh, from the pain and terror the victims experience when they hunt their victims and they kill them. So, as mentioned before, there's no sexual element or minimal sexual element, and they tend to um, target strangers. And also, whenever they do the killing, it tends to be brief. They don't. Uh, keep their victims for long. And the example we have here is the Zodiac Killer. Um, he was never caught, so we don't have a real picture of him. Um, uh, but over time, he wrote cryptic messages to the media. So he sent uh, letters that look like this to the media. And he has anywhere between 3 to 37 victims. One of the statements that he wrote in these cryptograms um, was that killing gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. So funny enough, these cryptograms are very hard for um, law enforcement to decipher. So they actually published them to the public to see if anyone can figure it out. And it took a husband and wife team. A husband actually happened to be a retired teacher to figure out what the message said. And then last but not least, we have the power and control serial killers. They gain pleasure in having complete power and control over victims. So there could be a sexual element over it, but it is about domination. And they often torture the victims and prolong the killings for satisfaction. So they keep them alive, they like to torture them, rape them, and they derive pleasure from being in control of people, gain pleasure from dominating their victims during rape, uh, not from necessarily from the sexual enjoyment aspect, although they will, they could have sexual enjoyment from them. And they tend to be hands-on in the killing, so they might go for strangulation. 
Uh, our example here is John Wayne Gacy, also known as Pogo the Clown. He handcuffed, raped, and murdered young male victims and buried them under the crawl space of his house. So he's from um, a small town in Iowa, I believe. And then he was part of the neighbor uh, neighborhood. He was the neighborhood clown. He knew his victims. And when the crimes were happening, when he would lure the boys into his house, and um, kidnapped them, uh, murdered and raped them. No one suspected it was him because he was Pogo the Clown, the neighborhood um, clown. And it took quite some time before they found uh, out that he was the killer and they found the bodies under the crawl space. So this is a picture of the crawl space with evidence markers around it. Right here is a picture of a layout of John Wayne Gacy's home. Um, so there is your house and they ended up tearing the house and there's uh the crawl space right underneath and that's where 26 bodies were found underneath that crawl space and then a body was found by the garage and one was found in the garage by the time he was caught all right so one thing that we want to focus on before we finish our presentation is psychopathy so um why would someone uh, commit crimes like this. And then one of the possible reasons is this condition called psychopathy, also known as antisocial personality disorder. So they're characterized by having no conscience. So the word conscience itself is an inner feeling or voice viewed as acting as a guide to the righteousness or wrongness of one's behavior. So people, when they grow up, they develop a conscience. That's from your executive functions, your frontal lobe. And then you learn right from wrong uh it's part of your morality and pe people that have antisocial personality develop uh, disorder don't develop that they only do what they feel like at the moment and what makes them happy with no regards to others so they lack empathy they don't care about other people's well-being causes of psychopathy are not known uh, but it's thought to involve stimulus reinforcement learning in the proper response to fearful and sad responses. So there are online websites that you can check off the psychopathy criteria, but here's a list, a short list of them. Uh, people who cr fall under antisocial personality disorder tend to disregard, have a disregard for the law. They tend to be repeat cr criminal offenders. They lie and use aliases or cons for personal profit. So impulsive liars, uh, they're impulsive. Uh, they tend to be aggressive with repeated physical fights. They tend to pick fights easily and they don't care. And they have a reckless disregard for others and their own safety. They cannot keep stable work due to the irresponsibility. And they show lack of remorse for other people's pain and suffering. Uh, so we have an example here. We have Mary Bell. Uh, sh she was diagnosed with psychopathy, and she uh, was killed a three- and a four-year-old in 1968 when she was just 10 years old. She broke into a nursery and left notes about her murder with a friend, and she actually carved her initials into one victim with scissors and mutilated his body.